Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're pleased to welcome Adam Benny Watts as our plenary, plenary speaker. Adam did his PhD at MIT with Aram Harrow, and he's currently a postdoc at the University of Waterloo working with uh, David Gossett and William Slofstra. Adam has done some really wonderful work in the area of quantum games, uh, quantum learning of states, and also work on showing extreme advantages for quantum shallow circuits. Today, we're excited to hear more about his work on quantum shallow circuits, so welcome, Adam. work? Yes, I think so. Good. Should I do something? Test, test, cool, awesome, all right. Thanks for, the, thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for TQC for inviting me. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here talking to you guys a little bit about uh, some of these things we can prove unconditionally about short depth circuits, uh, quantumly and classically. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna talk about joint work with these lovely people. Uh, two papers, one sort of recent, one a little older. And uh, yeah, well, we'll talk about the papers as we get to them. But I'd like to start the talk by saying something that you know, technically isn't even correct, but is gonna get our heads pointed in the right direction. And that's to say that this is a talk about complexity theory. And a lot of the time in complexity theory, what we're thinking about is trying to prove conditional statements about very strong models of computation. You know, we sort of start with P and then work our way up. And you know, there, you can't prove anything unconditionally. You know, you prove that a problem is hard, assuming P is not equal to NP, and stuff like that. In this talk, we're gonna think about tr proving things unconditionally but about very weak models of computation. So all the problems we're gonna talk about are sort of easy problems to solve. They're, they're, they're natural problems, you know, you could probably solve them on a piece of paper, uh, but we're gonna prove unconditional statements about separations between sort of weak models of computation to try and solve these problems. And in particular, we're gonna talk about unconditional separations between things called short depth circuits. And in particular, short depth or constant depth, quantum and classical circuits. And yeah, so that's where we're headed. Where are we gonna start? Well, we're gonna start uh, just by talking about classical uh, complexity theory for a moment. Because uh, we wanna prove these unconditional separations, so we need to start by just asking, you know, what do we know is hard classically? What are some problems that we can't solve with these constant depth classical circuits? Okay, and to answer that question, I need to tell you what I mean by a constant depth classical circuit. And that's gonna take us through a bit of a alphabet soup of, uh, of you know, complexity classes. But uh, it's a nice story and we're gonna go through it for a little bit and hopefully, uh, you know, I think it's worth doing. Okay, so what's the first complexity class we're gonna talk about? It's these things called NC0 circuits. Uh, here the N stands for NIC, that's not a joke. And the, the Z0 stands for the depth. So these are uh, sort of the simplest constant depth circuits that you can imagine. Uh, they're made of just a constant number of layers of AND and OR gates that have bounded fan-ins. So you're taking ands and ors of just a constant number of bits. 
you're allowed to do one sort of strange thing, which is you have this unbounded fan out gate. So I can copy a bit to as many bits as I want. But otherwise, uh, I'm just doing ands and ors of constant size things. This is what an NC0 circuit looks like. And uh, these circuits are nice because we can prove lower bounds for them. Uh, and in particular, these circuits can't compute the and of n bits. And this argument is actually pretty straightforward. It's, you know, uh, what we would call a light cone argument. And the idea is if you look at a single output bit of this circuit and sort of trace backwards, you can see that it depends on at most a constant number of input bits. So any bit of output depends on at most a constant number of bits of input. And so you can't do something, you can't do any n bit function. And in particular, you can't do an n bit and. Okay, so we've got a circuit class. We've got a problem that it can't solve. What are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna add the ability to solve that problem to the circuit class, and we're gonna get a stronger circuit class. So if you do that, you get these things called AC0 circuits, which are just like NC0 circuits, but I've augmented my ands and ors so that they can now have unbounded fan in. I can now do the and and the or of as many bits as I want. Uh, this makes the circuit class stronger. In particular, you know, already we've sort of broken any sort of light cone argument that you might wanna make, because one bit can depend on all of the input bits. But there's still problems that's hard for this circuit class. So now these AC0 circuits can't compute parity. And now we're already hitting sort of classic results in computer science. These arguments aren't easy, but this is proof of something called a switching lemma. And it was proved a little while ago. Okay, we've got a circuit class. We've got a problem it can't solve. We know the routine. We're gonna add this now. You're gonna add the ability to compute parities to AC0 circuits. And you get these things called AC02 circuits. And this two stands for a mod two gate, a parity gate. Uh, and so it's just like before, except for we now have these unbounded fan in parity gates. And now there's still a problem that's hard for this class. Uh, and so this is, you know, uh, another classic result in computer science. Uh, but if you have these AC02 gates, so you have parity, you can't compute mod three or mod P for any other prime. And this result also holds if you switch two and P. So if I give you an AC0 P gate, or I give you a mod P gate or an AC0 P circuit, then I can't compute parity or mod three or mod Q for any Q that's co-prime with P or prime. Um, okay, this is nice. Uh, you know, the, the, the alphabet soup is, is trugging, trugging along. We've got one more, two more. Uh, now what are we gonna do? We're gonna take all these things that we couldn't do, all of these parities. We're gonna add that power to our constant depth circuit. And we get these things called ACC zero circuits. Um, so now I've added ands, ors with unbounded fan in and any mod m gate that I want. So I can do all modular arithmetic and I can do ands and ors. And this is where this uh, sort of chain of inclusion stops. Uh, as far as we know, if you're working unconditional, I mean, we have no unconditional separations between ACC zero circuits and P. So for all we know, everything you can do in polynomial time, you can do with one of these circuits. And we can't separate P from NP, so you know, if you're looking for unconditional separations, you can't go any farther than this. So I could stop here, but just sort of for completeness, I'm gonna tell you about one final circuit class. And there's, these are these things called TC0 circuits. Uh, and they're like these ACC0 circuits, except for now I'm giving you threshold gates. So majority gates on as many bits as you want. And I could have drawn a circuit diagram like the one that I had before, but instead I put this sort of a picture because the reason you know, people often talk about TC0 circuits now is because they're thinking about things like shallow neural networks. And the fact that these circuits are very powerful uh, is sort of related to the fact that you know, these neural networks maybe do something exciting. And this is not at all my field, so I'm not gonna say more than that, but it's just worth knowing if you're talking about these constant depth circuits. Okay, so that's it. That's all the, all the classical circuit definitions. Uh, but I promised I'd tell you not just about the circuits, but about separations. And so if you wanna prove separations, if you wanna prove problems that are, you know, separations between these various circuit classes, the first thing you should ask is, uh, well, what type of separation are we gonna prove? Because, uh, yeah, what, and, and the type of separation you're trying to prove really matters. So the first separation we're gonna think about are separations for these things called decision problems. And this is, this is probably the separation you had in your mind when we started. Sort of implicitly, this is the type of separation we've been working with. And a decision problem just asks, given input x, compute a single bit function of that input. Right? Given an input x, compute some output bit, zero or one. 
And we were talking about decision problem this whole time. When we had this sort of chain of inclusions, we said that, you know, NC0 circuits couldn't compute AND, AC0 circuits couldn't compute parity, so on and so forth. So if you're thinking about decision problems, you have this very nice chain of inclusions, chain of separations between all these circuit classes we were talking about. But you could talk, for, talk about other sorts of separations. Uh, you could talk about these things called relational or maybe search problems. And here, they're sort of like decision problems, except for we're not trying to compute a function from n bits to a single bit. We're trying to compute a function from n bits to m bits. And now, because it's a function from n bits to m bits, there's not necessarily just one correct answer, but you know, there's possibly a string of correct answers, or a, a list of correct answers. And so this is why it's called a search problem. You know, given an input, you're sort of searching for a valid output. But classically, these sorts of separations aren't that interesting, because these search problems are just a more general class of problems. All the separations we had for decision problems, we also have for search problems, and so there's sort of nothing new to say here. But we're still not done, because uh, we can also talk about a sort of different type of problem. So it's kind of subtle and kind of nice, and these are sampling problems. So now the problem is, uh, is not to compute a function, but rather to sample from a distribution. So you're given access to some random bits, no input, except for these random bits, and you're just trying to produce a sample from some fixed target distribution D. And here the thing I want to tell you is that these sort of sampling problems and the separations are subtle. They're sort of uh, interesting beasts. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate this with an example. It's a sort of very simple NC0 circuit. It's going to take as input n bits that you know, could be random. You should think of them as random. And it's going to produce as output n plus 1 bits. And it's going to do a very simple computation. You know, every output bit, uh, R1 and Rn are just copied, and all the other output bits just depend on the sum, mod 2, or the XOR, of two input bits. So I haven't drawn the guts of this circuit, but you should believe that it's something that I can do with an NC0 circuit. It's a simple computation. And if these n input bits are uniformly random, these n plus 1 output bits are going to be uniformly random, but even. And you can check this, you know, by just summing them all up and, you know, checking the overall Hamming weight if you want. But this is a little weird, because another way of saying that the output is even is saying that this final bit, this n plus 1 output bit, is equal to the parity of the n bits above it. And this should feel a little weird, because we said that these NC0 circuits can't compute parity, right? AC0 circuits can't even compute parity. But here's a circuit, an NC0 circuit, that sort of is spoofing a parity computation, right? It's sampling from x, where x is uniformly random, and the parity of x. So if you look at the circuit, it looks like a, you're doing a parity computation, even though this is hard for NC0. And this isn't a contradiction or anything. These are sort of different types of problems. But I just bring this up to say that you know, these sampling separations are subtle. OK, given this, can you prove sampling separations for NC0? You know, what can you say? And the answer is yes, you can prove separations. You just have to think about slightly more interesting functions. So inst if instead of thinking about parity, you think about this, this function called major mod function, uh, which uh, major mod or majority mod p, it's a weird function, but it does sort of what it says on the tin. Uh, you take a bit string, you take its Hamming weight mod p, and then you check if it's above or below p over 2. So if you define this major mod function, and then try and sample from the distribution x major mod p of x, Viola showed, and Emanuele Viola showed about 10 years ago, a little more than that, that it's hard to sample from this distribution with an NC0 circuit. And he showed this up to sort of one important restriction, which is the number of bits of randomness that you're allowed to take as input to the circuit are bounded. And in particular, you don't get many more bits of entropy than what you need. Right? To sample from this distribution, you need n bits of entropy, and Viola shows his lower bound when you have only slightly more, n plus n to the delta, where delta is less than 1. So you're given just barely more than enough entropy to sample from the distribution, and you can't do that with an NC0 circuit. OK. And this is the separation that we're going to care about a lot in this talk. But uh, you know, just sort of for, for completeness, I should tell you that this result came out in 2010, and since then there's been a lot of stronger separations proved. So uh, you know, there, there are now separations where you remove this restriction on the number of random bits. There are separations where you um, could have separations not against NC0 circuits, but AC0 circuits. Uh, but those all sort of involve more complicated distributions that you know, we, we can't quite attack yet. So we're not going to think about them in this talk, but I just want to tell you that they exist. OK. 
So that's it for the classical world. Uh, now we're going to move on to sort of friendlier territory, maybe. And we're going to talk now about quantum circuits. And we're going to ask, you know, we have all these two problems that are hard for classical circuits. Uh, can we attack any of them with quantum circuits? What sort of separations are out there? And I'm just going to take you through the results first, and then with the time that we have left, we're going to talk about proof techniques. So we're just going to first run through sort of the separations that we know. Uh, but before we do that, just like in the classical case, we're going to need to, we're going to, need to define some things. Uh, luckily, now there's only one circuit class, and it's probably what you have in your mind when you picture a constant depth classical circuit. And these are these things called QNC0 circuits. So these are circuits made up of uh, you know, a constant number of layers of constant size unitary gates acting on the all zero state. Uh, so if you want a picture of that, it looks you know, like, like the circuit diagrams that you draw. And the, you know, notice that I haven't uh, picked a fixed gate set or anything like that. I haven't even restricted us to one and two cubic gates. I've just said constant size unitary gates stacked in a constant number of layers. You could be a little more restrictive if you want, but this is sort of a nice, nice circuit model to work with. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat general. Um, and now, if you work with a circuit model and you try and prove unconditional separations, you try and sample from something or, or compute some function with a QNC0 circuit that you can't compute with an NC0 circuit, well, if you're looking for a decision problem separation, that's impossible. Uh, and why is this impossible? It's impossible for the same reason that we had, uh, you know, that uh, NC0 circuits couldn't compute uh, ands. You know, it's just a light cone argument. So if I look at, out, look at an output bit of a QNC0 circuit, it depends on at most a constant number of input bits. This is actually a bad picture because the light cone takes everything. But you know, if, if there were more input bits, you'd see that any output qubit can depend on at most a constant number of input qubits. So it's just a function of a constant number of bits. And this is something that you know you can do classically. So if you're looking for decision problem separations, you know, you're out of luck. And this, you know, this might just be the end of the story. But then, about six or seven years ago, uh, you know, th there's this sort of field opening result by uh, Bravi, Gossett, and Koenig that pointed out that if you don't think about decision problems, but if you think about search problems, then you can get an unconditional separation. So they gave a search problem that you could solve with a constant depth QNC0 circuit, but that you couldn't solve with any constant depth NC0 circuit. And this, you know, this, this was you know, surprising, and it was also, also really nice, because now we had just some totally unconditional separation between these constant depth quantum circuits and constant depth classical circuits. Uh, so a couple years later, this result got strengthened to be a separation between uh, not QNC0 circuits and NC0 circuits, but QNC0 circuits and AC0 circuits. And then a couple years after that, it got strengthened again, uh, where the model changed just, just a little bit. Uh, your, your circuit measurements were now interactive in this very, very loose sense in which you just measure in two rounds. Um, but uh, under this slightly more general model, a separation was shown against AC0 P circuits. You know, so AC0 circuits with mod P gates for any prime P. Um, yeah, and I'm not gonna say more about this paper, but I, I like it, so I put it up here. And it's, 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 there's some nice ideas in it. Um, but okay, we said that for decision problems, there's no separations possible. And now for search problems, we've gotten about as strong a separation as you could hope for. Because remember, if you go past AC0P, you get ACC, and that might be all of, all of P and all of, you know, you, you run out of the ability to do things unconditionally. So, both, so for both uh, decision problems and for sort of search problems, We've done everything that we can do. So what's left? Well, let's think about sampling problems. And this is a, a more recent result that I want to tell you about, uh, which is that you know, there's some function f with a property that if you uh, think about this distribution f x of f, x f of x, like what uh, Viola did for major mod, uh, you can sample from this distribution approximately with a QNC0 circuit. And this is approximately in total variation distance if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. If you do, I mean, it's, it's sort of nice. And you can't sample from that distribution with an NC0 circuit, you know, up to a fairly large total variation distance. So uh, it's, it's sort of a first result, but we're starting to see now unconditional sampling separations between these constant of quantum circuits. 
and classical circuits. Okay. Uh, now, I haven't told you what this function is. Uh, why haven't I? Well, I will in a second. Um, here it is. And I, I don't do this because I you know, expect anyone to really parse this full definition, but I do this just because I don't want to hide the fact that you know, the function is really ugly, and that's sort of unpleasant. But if you stare at it really hard, you see that there's sort of this mod p story going on. And so you might think that this, is, this function is sort of inspired by this major mod function that we were talking about earlier. And that's, that's essentially correct. I mean, it's this function that we call pm maj mod, and it, it looks, you know, it's, it's got some of the same flavor as the major mod p function, and that, that is an important idea. So, you know, that's the function. Uh, it's a mess, but, you know, hopefully we can see a little bit about where it comes from. Okay. So those are the results I want to talk about. Uh, and now, with the remaining time, how much time do I have left? Perfect, great. So with the remaining 25 minutes, uh, we, can, we can have a bit of fun. So now, uh, now I want to just sort of take you through some of the proof techniques that we use to, to prove some of these separations. Uh, and I've drawn a picture of the IKEA man here, because uh, what we're going to do is sort of the IKEA method of proof. You know, I'm not going to actually fully construct any of these proofs for you. I'm just going to give you a few structural, structural elements, you know, a few sort of big ideas. And then hopefully, if you want to, you could construct the proofs from your, for yourself in your living room later, something like that. But I sort of thought that maybe more useful than seeing any of these proofs in complete detail is just getting some of these nice sort of core ideas at the heart of them. And what are these ideas? They're, they're basically just circuit identities. So we're going to build some nice ones. OK. And now before we do this, I need to review some information uh, about just a very nice state, the GHZ state. Uh, probably a lot of you know about it. If you don't, don't worry. It's just a uniform superposition of all zeros and all ones. What are some properties of it? Here's one nice one. If I act with a Pauli Z on any qubit of the state, what am I going to do? I'm just going to flip the sign in front of the all ones branch. So I get all zeros minus all ones, and I get that state whether I act with a Pauli Z on the first qubit or the second qubit or the nth qubit. I mean, this should seem not too surprising. Uh, but here's the same information sort of written in circuit diagram notation, because at some point we're going to want to switch over to thinking about circuit diagrams. OK, so this is nice. It's probably not, not hugely surprising yet. Uh, let's think not about Pauli Zs, but let's think about Z rotations. So e to the i theta Zs. Uh, and now the same thing is true. If I act with a Z rotation on any qubit of my GHZ state, it's the same as acting with a Z rotation on any other qubit. You know, I can shift them around. And in particular, that means that if I act with a Z rotation on each qubit of my GHZ state, I could shift them all to one qubit, say the nth qubit, and then the rotation angles just add up. So here's this uh, sort of equation written out in circuit diagram notation. I take a GHZ state, I apply Z rotations to every qubit. So the same thing as applying a single Z rotation by the sum of all those angles. OK. So now I'm going to ask you to do something you know, dangerous in a talk. Take that fact, store it away in your brain for a moment. I'm going to tell you something completely different, and then we're going to smush them together. So we have these GHZ states. We know how they behave under rotations. What happens if instead you apply a Hadamard transformation to the GHZ state? So you know, a Hadamard transformation or a discrete Fourier transform, uh, you know, I'm just going to put a Hadamard gate on every qubit of the GHZ state. And what I get out is a uniform superposition over even weight bit strings. This is, you know, this is not too bad to check. You just look through the phases. Some cancel, some don't. Uh, but here it is, again, in circuit diagram notation. So my GHG state, a bunch of Hadamards. If I measure, I get a bit string Y with even parity. Um, or I could rewrite this in the way that we sort of did earlier, where I say that the nth bit of this bit string computes the parity of all the bits above it. OK. Last thing we need to think about, what happens if I apply a Z gate before these Hadamards? Well, that's the same thing as applying an X gate after the Hadamards. It's going to flip a single bit. And instead of getting a uniform superposition over even bit strings, I'm going to get a uniform superposition over odd bit strings. Right? So you know, everything's the same. I just have a Z gate applied before my Hadamards. Now I get a bit string Y with odd parity, or you know, the nth bit is equal to the parity plus 1. OK. So two ideas, both sort of nice. Uh, 
What about these Z rotations? What about this Hadamard transformation? What happens if you smush them together? And if you smush them together, you get an idea that showed up actually a long time ago in this paper by Hoyer and Spalik, where they called it rotation by Hemingway. And we're going to build up to this sort of carefully. So as a warm up, let's just think about what happens with this circuit. So I have a GHZ state. I have some other, you know, bunch of qubits and some computational basis state X. And I'm going to do a bunch of controlled Z rotations from these upper qubits to the lower ones. Then I'm going to apply a bunch of Hadamards. And then I'm going to measure everything. And the question is, what's the relationship between this output fit string Y and this computational basis state X that I had as input to the circuit? And I'm going to tell you in a second, but you know, I'm going to, I'm going to wait like a whole five seconds so that you can think about it first, because it, it's worth trying to answer this in your head. It's sort of the, the beginning of a very nice idea. Well, the answer is that this, uh, this output bit string Y will have a parity equal to the parity of this input Hamming weight, you know, this input computational basis state X, right? Because I'm doing controlled Zs off of, whoop, I'm doing controlled Zs from this computational basis state X. Uh, so the total number of Zs that happens is equal just to the Hamming weight of X. And every two Zs cancel out. So if X has even parity, I've basically done nothing. I'm applying Hadamard's to a GHC state. I'm get, getting an even bit string. If X has hot, odd Hamming weight, there's going to be one Z that survives. Now I'm in the other case, but I have Zs and then Hadamard's, and I'm going to get an odd parity bit string. Um, so you know, that's where this expression comes from. You could rewrite it as saying that the final bit now computes the parity of all the Ys above it, plus the parities of the Xs. Uh, and I'm going to say one other thing, which is that this circuit, you know, might look like it's doing nothing, but it's actually kind of a fun circuit. Because if I wanted to coherently measure the parity of this X state, let's say I have a superposition over computational basis states, and I want to measure their parity, I could apply one of these circuits and measure these Y bits, and I'm going to learn only the parity of the X bits. So I'm going to, you know, I've sort of learned no information by measuring the Ys other than what the parity of, the, of this X computational basis state is. So that's sort of nice already. OK, and it sort of tells you that with a GHC state, you can start to do the, at least these parity computations that we know are hard for NC0 circuits and AC0 circuits. OK, but you can do something a lot more interesting. If instead of applying a Z gate, you apply a Z rotation. So you have these controlled sort of RZs acting on each qubit of your GHC state. And what happens now? Well. It's sort of like, the way to do this is to do analysis sort of like what we did before. So first, let's think about what happens if the Hamming weight of x is a 0 mod p. And in that case, you know, when you add up all of these z, z rotations, you're either going to get nothing or you're just going to get a minus sign, so a global phase applied. And so in those two cases, oh, you can't really see them, but there's supposed to be a dot down here and a dot down here. Right? When your Hamming weight of x is 0 mod p, then this bit string y that you're going to get out is going to be even. Now, if your Hamming weight of x is close to p over 2, uh, then when you add up all these z rotations, you're going to have a single, controlled, a single z acting on your GHC state. And in that case, you're going to get an odd parity bit string. Uh, it's sort of the same, same case as what we did on the last slide. So you've got these two extremes. When the Hamming weight is 0 mod p, you get even. When it's close to p over 2 mod p, you get odd. And you, uh, if you do the math, you sort of interpolate between these two things. And this curve is a cosine squared curve. OK. Now this is, you know, this is sort of funny. Now we're doing some sort of modular arithmetic. And we can make it a little more precise uh, if you plot a different function. And this function in orange is just this major mod p function that uh, Viola defined a little while ago. So this function is 0 if the Hamming weight is less than p over 2, and 1 if it's more than p over 2. OK, and now these functions don't quite line up. But if you shifted one of them by a quarter of a period, they'd start to agree. Uh, and so that's exactly what I'm saying here, is that you know, if you look at this sort of rotation by Hamming weight circuit, what you're doing is you're sort of approximately computing a major mod now. And you, know, you can rewrite it to say that this, this final bit now is approximately computing a major mod plus a parity. OK. And this now starts to be exciting, because now you see that these QNC0 circuits with a GHC state input can approximately compute this function uh, that we know is hard to sample from classically. 
Okay, so that's trick number one. It's maybe the most important trick that I'm gonna tell you about. And uh, you know, I was pointing it towards the major mod problem, but it's at the heart of a lot of these sort of circuit separations. Um, and you know, it's really just saying that you can do modular arithmetic with GHC states in constant depth. And that's something that's generally hard to do classically. So you, know, you can use this, and this has been used for a lot of things, and it's sort of a nice, nice idea. Okay, here's another trick. Uh, and to sort of motivate this one, let me remind you that the, um, the circuit separation that we were just looking at had a GHG state as input. But now a GHG state, you know, if you could construct a GHG state in constant depth, then this whole thing would be a QNC zero circuit and we'd be very happy. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that. You can show that in fact you can't construct a GHG state with a QNC zero circuit. So the circuit that we were just looking at with the GHG state input is not something we can actually do in constant depth quantum mechanically. How do you get around that? Well, you get around that with this thing called a poor man's GHC state. Uh, and so here's the picture of the circuit that constructs the poor man's GHC state. Uh, I'll explain it a little bit. Uh, I mean, the idea is to take first, uh, just, so I guess this is a QNC zero circuit now. It's gonna take as input just a bunch of qubits, all zeros. You're gonna Hadamard sort of every other qubit. So you're gonna get a uniform superposition over computational basis states on those qubits. And then you're gonna compute the parities uh -oh, of adjacent qubits. So, you know, pairwise, you're gonna compute the parity of qubits one and three and three and five and so on and so forth. And you're gonna measure these things. And after you measure, what do you get? Well, you know, the first qubit's gonna be a zero or a one, uh, or sort of a superposition of zero and one. But once you've picked that qubit, you know the value of the third qubit. It's gonna be, you know, zero plus D1. And then you know the value of the fifth qubit, it's gonna be zero plus D1 plus D2. And so if you trace this out, what you see is that you get a uniform superposition of just two possible bit strings, you know, Z and Z complement. And this thing looks, you know, a lot like a GHC state, but isn't quite the same thing. Uh, you know, because instead of being all zeros plus all ones, it's just a uniform superposition of some computational basis state and its complement. Uh, so that's just saying that, you know, that the, the ith value of this z string is just determined by summing up these d's. Um, and now, what was I gonna tell you about this? It'll come back to me. Anyways, yeah, yeah, so this is something you can, ah, this is something you can construct in constant depth. Uh, one other way to think about it is sort of as a, it looks like a GHC state, but with some sort of Pauli X errors appearing on it. And these d's sort of tell you the syndrome, or they tell you where the Pauli X errors show up. Okay, and now what do you do? Well, a lot of the time when you have a circuit separation that works off of a GHC state, you just plug in a poor man's GHC state instead and hope that you still have a separation. Uh, this isn't you know, guaranteed to work for you, uh, but it often does. If your circuit is Clifford, it's very nice because you sort of have these Pauli X errors that you can just run through the Clifford circuit. Uh, if your circuit isn't Clifford, everything gets mangled, but if you sort of work hard and are careful, you can see that the, the separation that you want to have survives. So this is a, you know, these are sort of two ingredients that show up in a lot of these circuit separation proofs. Is you do some modular arithmetic with a GHZ state, you sub it out for a poor man's GHZ state, uh, you push these Pauli errors through, and you hope that you don't ruin stuff too much as you do this. Okay, these are two classic ideas. They're sort of, they've classic, they've shown up in the past, you know, sort of seven years worth of papers. This last one is sort of a newer idea. Uh, that showed up in my paper with Natalie. And we didn't have a name for it in the paper, but I had to give it a name for this talk, so I call it this sort of mutual rotation. And it's a bit of a weird idea. So, you know, maybe someone here knows it in a different context and has something, they can tell me about it afterwards, which would be great. But to motivate this idea, let me now think sort of explicitly about trying to make a sampling separation. So, uh, if we go back to the sort of rotation by Hamming weight that we were talking about, you get a circuit sort of like this, and you see that this nth bit computes a parity plus a major mod. And now I could set it up so this x bit string is uh, you know, uniformly random, and so then it looks quite a bit like we're sampling from major mod, which is the thing that we knew was hard to do classically. And so you think, you know, at this point you might already think that you have a sampling separation. But you don't, and you don't for a sort of subtle reason. And the reason is that if you look at this circuit, it's a circuit on two n qubits, right? If, if this x string has, has size n and the GHG state has size n. 
This is a circuit on 2n qubits. And remember, Viola's lower bound was only about a, a classical circuit that had access to n bits of randomness. So if you claim a sampling, sampling separation at this point, you're sort of comparing apples to oranges. You know, you've got twice as much randomness in the quantum circuit as you have in the lower bound classically. This just doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a fair comparison. So what do we need to do? We somehow need to, to remove half of the qubits involved in this circuit. How would we like to do that? Well, let me pre-process the circuit just a tiny bit. So I'm gonna take these Hadamard gates. Oh yeah. I'm gonna rotate them over to the other side of my GHC state. So I've just changed all of my uh, Z rotations to X rotations. And now, you know, it's, it's the same circuit, it's computing the same function. But somehow I'd like to remove half of the qubits. Uh, and now this GHC state seems pretty essential. So I, I don't think we're getting rid of that. Uh, but just, just let's imagine that we could somehow remove this X state completely. So that instead of computing a major mod of X, you're computing a major mod of Y. So somehow you could take these controls that were lying on the X qubits and drag them down so that they're lying on these output qubits Y. Okay, now what would you like to do? You'd like to do something that, you know, I can't compile with QTXZ for a good reason, because it makes no sense. But if instead of trying to compile it, you drew a picture, you know, I'd like to do something sort of like this. Okay, this is a weird picture, uh, but I'd like to take each of these controlled rotations and then just control them on the same qubit. Now this is, uh, you know, this is no longer a unitary matrix. This is sort of no longer quantum mechanics, but I am talking about some well-defined matrix operations. So I want, you know, sort of the boxes that act on my qubits like this, you know, where if it's a zero, it does nothing, and if it's a one, and it applied some X rotation. Okay, now I said this is nonsense. Uh, it's nonsense, you know, for a very technical reason, or, you know, you can make very clear why this is nonsense. Uh, these sort of funny controlled boxes are non-unitary. So, you know, I, I've now gone from making a quantum circuit to some super quantum circuit with non-unitary operations that samples from the distribution that we want to sample from. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna try and drag ourselves back to the realm of quantum mechanics. And so here's our first observation, which is that if you're looking at the circuit that's acting on the GHZ state, I've now written it as this even N, so that's just a, this is the Hadamard transform applied to the GHZ state. Um, it's just as good to have these controls acting from qubit one on qubit one, as it would be to have a control acting from qubit one on qubit two, and qubit two on qubit three, qubit three on qubit four, but then at some point you've got to cycle back around and act from qubit one, have a control acting from qubit n back up to qubit one, or qubit m back up to qubit one. And now if you look at the thing, this is still non-unitary, but if you look at the funny non-unitary operation in this orange box, and you think hard about it, you see that it actually lies pretty close to some unitary operation. Uh, so, you know, you can find a unitary that is, you know, and, and sort of pick, pick a norm that you want to work with and, and massage some norms, and you can see that this, this uh, non-unitary AM theta is really an approximately, you know, it's very close to a unitary operation. And how do you show that? Um, I'm just gonna give you one, one little tiny flavor of the proof. And I'm gonna say that if you look at this non-unitary operation, and you look at its action on computational basis states, what do you see? Well, you'll see that it preserves a norm. And all of this is not too bad. You just sort of expand out the definition of this thing and look at what it does. But you see that it preserves a norm of these computational basis states. Uh, you see that if you have two computational basis states uh, that are initially orthogonal, they're also orthogonal after this non-unitary operation, as long as one is not the complement of the other. So you know, if this Y is not the complement of X, then you map orthogonal things to orthogonal things. And if the y is the complement of x, what happens? Well, then you get something that's not zero. So this is the non-unitary part, but it's very small. It sort of falls off like the sine m to the theta. So it falls off, you know, theta is small, it falls off exponentially in m. And so if you take these three facts and sort of massage them a little bit and, you know, use Gram-Schmidt to define some unitary that's close by, uh, then you find exactly the claim that I had on the previous slide that this AM theta is in fact close to some unitary matrix. Okay, so that's trick number three. 
that's, uh, that's actually it for sort of the quantum tricks that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, and now what do you do? Well, you sort of take the, these ideas, you, you plug them into each other in the right way, and you get an unconditional separation. And this is the thing that I'm not gonna tell you about, but I'm sort of gonna hope that you trust me, that if you stick these things together in the right order, you can get pretty much all the separations that I told you about on the previous slides. And uh, this sort of recipe of doing modular arithmetic and then replacing your poor man's GHZ state is sort of the key idea. Okay, uh, let me just end, maybe early, with a few open questions. Um, so a few sort of specific ones related to the work that I was talking about. Uh, and one one is, um, you know, we sort of talked about this UM theta unitary. M is only constant. You know, you only need M to be a constant for our application. So this is a constant sized unitary, but we don't have an explicit way to construct it. We just sort of have this closeness argument to say that it's, you know, near this non-unitary operation. Uh, but it would be very nice to just have an explicit way to compile it, write it down as a sequence of one and two you know, cubic gates. So it'd be especially nice if you actually want to implement any of these circuits. Another one that's sort of subtle is that uh, we have these sampling separations, but if you want to actually do an experiment and claim that you've exhibited such a separation, well, you need to verify that your quantum circuit actually did what you said it would do. Uh, and this is hard for sort of a technical reason. Uh, you know, remember that the output of this circuit is supposed to be x, f of x, where x is uniformly random and f of x is some function. You can check that this f of x bit is right very easily. You know, you can check that you've correctly computed the function. Uh, but you also need to check that these first n bits are uniformly random. And that's very hard to do. I mean, unless you're gonna do enough samples that you actually just see all the outputs. You know, it's sort of hard to verify that your quantum circuit is actually sampling from a uniformly random distribution like you want it to. Another question is, uh, you know, whether we can prove stronger sampling separations. So, you know, this result that I told you about was a sampling separation against NC0 circuits, but you'd like to push it farther, right? I, I said that there were results against AC0 circuits. There were results without this restriction on the number of random bits. You know, all of these, we already have classical lower bounds. Now we just need to find a quantum circuit that beats them. Or, you know, maybe we can't. And maybe we can't for a good reason, because maybe these classical lower bounds actually extend to the quantum case. And this would be sort of interesting, right? This would give us some ways of bounding what you can do, you know, the states that you can produce with a constant depth quantum circuit. And so that would be an interest, interesting direction too. Okay, and finally, you know, this point is sort of cheating because you could put it at the end of every quantum talk, but you know, is any of this useful, you know? Uh, and what do I mean by that in this circumstance? I mean, you know, we've got these nice complexity theoretic separations, uh, but uh, it would be very nice, you know, we've got these nice complexity theoretic separations, and we have these nice tricks, these nice circuit identities that we use to prove them, but I'd love to see these circuit identities used, you know, for more practical things, you know? Uh, these, are, these are essentially compiling tricks, but, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether any of this ports over in a nice way to the compiling literature. Or, you know, maybe even just a, a practical circuit that's computing something that you care about. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're sort of thinking hard about these complexity theoretic, sep theoretic separations and, and learning more, but I think it's time to start maybe trying to bring some of this stuff over to more practical applications. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Test. Yes, I'm still okay. Is there another microphone on? Thanks for the lovely talk, Adam. Are there questions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Um, so I guess one of the open questions, I don't know if you're interested in that one, is, is whether you can also restrict the quantum model, because I guess now you're assuming a, an ideal quantum circuit um, Yeah, yeah. The realistic quantum circuits would have some geometric 
locality, which I, I think your circuit doesn't have. Yeah, and, yeah. and would be noisy, at least to with the, with the constant noise. Uh, so I this direction, uh, is yeah. there any um, progress in that? Yeah. The, okay. These are great questions. Uh, so okay, I think if you're if you're not thinking about sampling separations, if you're thinking about these search problem separations. Yeah. There we have it. Yeah. Yes. There yeah. we at least have the ability to add noise. Um, for sampling, I think okay. Yeah, okay, good. yeah, okay. So for sampling, uh, the, at least the circuit that we have, you're right to say that it's, it's not geometrically, geometrically local. Uh, you sort of have to have this binary tree construction, which is a problem. You could probably get around that. Uh, and for noise, I mean, with, with some thought, you might be able to get around that. Uh, and then for noise, you know, at least at the moment, there's a, there's a distance and total variation distance between what you can do quantumly and the best you can do classically. So uh, if you want to be in two, you know, it, this means you can tolerate some amount of noise, but probably not very much. It's a small distance. Um, so if you want to push beyond that, probably you want to build some sort of error correction into the, into the circuit. Um, yeah, I, I guess I think a lot of the, you, you can certainly try to use the same tricks that people use for sampling, se for search separations, in this case, to do sampling. And I think, it, I see no reason this shouldn't be possible, but I couldn't tell you how much work it's going to be. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. That was a really excellent talk. Um, I was wondering, this UM30 unitary, Yes. Uh, if I remove one of the control gates, it looks like it's got depth M. Is that right? Uh, let me see. Is so, uh, yes, yes, yes. It definitely has depth M. Mm -hmm. uh, but thankfully for our application, M is, is a constant. I mean, M, you can get away with M being three or four. Okay. Yeah, but you're, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, the depth will scale with M of this thing, absolutely. Do you expect that like a, the, this compilation for, for the unitary would be just something that's depth N because it could be as bad as like depth exponential in M or something? Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, you're right. Uh, and this is, this is, yeah, this is, this is a weakness of the result. I mean, M is a constant, so you know, exponential in M is still a constant. Uh, but you have to be a little more careful than that because there's also this theta parameter. So what, what I'd really like to see is a depth M compilation, or you know, short depth compilation, where the only thing, you know, where the thetas just turn into single qubit rotations. And then if you have arbitrary single qubit rotations in C naught gates, let's say, the depth stays constant. And you know, I think that should be true. We actually thought we had a construction and then we realized we didn't. Uh, but you know, something like just this chain of rotations, controlled rotation should do it. Uh, but I don't know what the circuit is. So it would be nice to see. One last related question. What would be the bound on like the error in the approximation with this A theta M? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so if you look at, if you look at this, you know, this A at theta M is almost unitary, but you have, you know, these terms that are off by an amount theta to the M. Now, I can't remember if the a factor of the dimension shows up or not, but if it does, it's, you know, your differ difference is sort of two to the m theta to the m, and as long as your theta is less than a half, uh, this is still going to vanish exponentially with m. Mm -hmm. So it's something, it's, it's either theta to the m or two theta, th two theta to the m is, is going to be your distance in whatever norm that you want. I mean, whether you pick up the dimension factor or not as you, as you juggle these norms. Thanks. Other questions? Hey, Adam. Um, it, the sampling task that you guys use for your separation, do you have an AC0 circuit for that, or is that a candidate for a stronger quantum classical separation? Sorry, do you say do you, do you have an explicit circuit for that? Yeah, can you, uh, can you sample from it with a classical AC0 circuit, or can you have stronger lower bounds? Ah, there? good, good. Um, so I, uh, unless I'm missing a recent result, uh, I don't think there's an AC0 circuit for it. And I mean, you know, there's certainly not an AC0 circuit for that, but it's sort of based on this just uh, major mod function. 
And I think even there, we don't have an AC0 lower bound. Uh, sorry, we don't have an AC0 circuit, but we also don't have an AC0 lower bound. And sort of notably, you know, there's been these stronger works by Viola where he proved stronger separations, but he's always had to change the sort of sampling task to do it. So I think proving a stronger classical lower bound there is probably hard, um, but I think it reasonable. Um, unless, yeah, yeah, let, let me put, put an asterisk on that, but that's, I think that's true. We have time for one more question. Okay, well, if not, you can keep talking to Adam at the coffee break. Let's thank him again.